Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm going to screen share for just a moment. While people are getting in, I want um, to invite you to sign in. Um, so let's see if you, you can, there's a URL that's been put into the chat. And if you scroll down, there's an area where you can put your name, your campus, and your role. And then through our first hour, um, you can take some notes here on any comments or, or ideas that stood out to you, got you thinking, raised a question or a concern. We'll start in just about a minute, but we want to give folks time to get into the room and again to access the document. So if you'll just click here, all of you should be able to add your name. I'll add mine to start. Hi, this is Kendra. Can you tell me where, where the document is one more time? Oh, Was sure. It, it... Let's get it. Um, let me check. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's in the chat. Should be in the chat. Okay, I, I just saw it now. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. You're welcome. Uh -huh. okay, so we're going to give folks a moment. So while everyone's signing in, because I see that's happening now, I want to welcome you um, to our seventh session of Civic Dialogues, Creating Civic Pathways. I am Kimberly Rosenfeld. I teach at Cerritos College. I'm a faculty member in the Communication Studies Department. I am joined today by Patty Robinson from College of the Canyons, and as well as Rebecca Moonstone, who is from 3CSN. She's our tech support and everything wonderful. And Keelan Koning, who I don't see on video right now, but she also is our tech support. Today, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment, but please continue to sign in, which is here. Okay, all of you are starting to do that. Um, today, uh, we are joined by, we are so excited to welcome two speakers. This is, I think, the first time, Patty, right? We've had two speakers in this series at once. Um, Drs. Elaine Ikeda and Dr. Rowena Tamengan. And Dr. Elaine Ikeda, is, has served since 2000 as the executive director of California Campus Compact. She has over 25 years experience in higher education, conducting research on service learning, volunteerism and community service, disseminating service learning and civic engagement resource materials and designing retreats, workshops and learning communities for college faculty, administrators, staff and students she has co-authored several journal articles and book chapters on service learning, community engagement, and student development. She holds a master's degree in public health and a master's and doctorate in higher education. And we're so happy to have Dr. Ikeda. We're also welcoming Dr. Rowena Tamengen. She is the president of San Jose City College. Dr. Tamingan received her EDD in International Multicultural Education with a concentration in Human Rights Education from the University of San Francisco. She holds an MA in English from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a BA in English from the University of California, Irvine. Rowena is a board member of, of the following. So I'm gonna provide a list right now. She's a very busy person, a board member of the Chief of the Chief Executive Officers of the California Community Colleges, the Asian Pacific Americans in Higher Education, the National Asian Pacific Islander Council, and California Campus Compact. She also serves as a co-chair for the Community Colleges for Democracy and is a member of the American Association of Community Colleges Commission on Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity. Rowena has been selected for multiple fellowships and has written and contributed to a variety of publications, including the Journal of Multicultural Perspectives. Welcome both Elaine and Rowena. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of Rowena and myself, uh, thank you all for joining us today and thank you to the planning team that invited us to be with you. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's Friday. Happy Friday, everybody. Um, it's also a time, you know, we're all coming from whether you're coming from a different Zoom call 
or you're experiencing some of the anxiety around the elections that I am personally feeling, um, as well as, uh, you know, the turmoil that's uh, going on in our world, whether it's around the pandemic or, you know, this week, the horrific killing of another uh, unnecessary killing of another black man. Um, so I just wanted to take a quick moment to um, just sort of get us centered and uh, focused on being here. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes we just have to slow, slow to a stop. We must slow to a stop and connect with the earth breathing beneath our feet and the air that is life passing through us. So, we need to land in this moment, be in the now, and maybe you might want to take a moment to just focus on your breathing, feel the inhale and the exhale of your breath. For some, you may want to put your hand over your heart to feel the rise and fall of your breath. And while you do that, I am going to um, read a short piece by um, John Gardner, and this is from the book, Living, Leading, and the American Dream. I speak for an optimism that does not assume it has found a cure for all of life's ills, that recognizes the deep intrinsic difficulties in social change, that accepts life's often unfavorable odds, but will not stop hoping or trying or enjoying when it's possible to enjoy. No doubt the world is, among other things, a veil of tears. It is full of absurdities that cannot be explained, evils that cannot be countenanced, injustices that cannot be excused. The individual who does not understand that is disarmed in a hazardous environment. But then there is the resilience of the human spirit Hope runs deeper than intellectual appraisal. We were designed for struggle, for survival. Only fatal and final injuries neutralize that irrepressible striving toward the light. Our conscious processes, the part of us that is saturated with words and ideas, may arrive at exceedingly gloomy appraisals, but an older, more deeply rooted, biologically and spiritually stubborn part of us continues to say yes to hoping, yes to striving, yes to life. And that's from a speech he gave called Recovery of Confidence in 1970. So thank you again for being with us. I'm gonna turn it over to my friend and colleague, Rowena Tomining, to get us going here. Let me unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Elaine. And uh, thank you uh, for the invitation to uh, for uh, this morning and the conversation on creating uh, civic pathways. And so um, now I feel very grounded from all of the Zooming already happening <laughs> since eight o'clock this morning. So I really appreciate that grounding, Elaine. And then also, I, um, I just wanted to comment on um, these types of grounding activities as really important uh, for um, all of us uh, to build community with, with each other and to be very present. Um, uh, some of you uh, might have heard me in other uh, sessions before or have worked with me in, in other projects. And so you will know that I, one of my sheroes is uh, Grace Lee Boggs, you know, who was a longtime movement activist uh, in Detroit. And she uh, talks so much about um, community, uh, valuing community, and then also uh, that movements really are born out of critical connections, making critical connections uh, rather than critical mass. And so uh, with that, I wanted to now share a little bit about my story um, of how I uh, came to be 
in terms of taking leadership around civic engagement, community engagement, and social justice work um, at three institutions that I've been privileged uh, to be part of uh, in uh, my journey in the community colleges. And so um, with that, um, I'll go ahead and um, just say a little bit about where I'm at uh, to just give you context. And so I am 10 months in, I just completed 10 months at my new institution, uh, San Jose City College, which is part of the San Jose Evergreen Community College District uh, in Silicon Valley uh, up in Northern California. And so I kind of situate uh, my work and my sort of return uh, back to the South Bay, uh, San Francisco South Bay, uh, because um, I've been tracking, you know, for two decades now, um, the increasing economic uh, wealth disparity happening in the Silicon Valley area, uh, really impacting uh, brown and black communities and with the COVID pandemic, it has just highlighted and again, has made very visible, you know, the inequality, uh, race and economic inequality that we experience, um, not only in the Bay Area, but in other parts of the state. So 10 months in at San Jose City College, and then prior to that, as Kimberly mentioned, I was uh, president of Berkeley City College um, uh, almost for four years. And so when I was, when I started in Berkeley in 2016, the last presidential general election was in 2016. So, um, so what I experienced as a new president um, there, um, you know, uh, was really crisis management as well because of after the election, you, you had the repeated attacks happening with our immigrant communities um, and other uh, racial groups uh, by the new government. And then we had white supremacy groups coming into Berkeley. And so there were a lot of violent um, interactions during the rallies and protests just outside of my campus. Uh, because Berkeley City College is just really one big urban building right across from City Hall and also the park where we always have uh, gatherings. So I was there for four years. Um, and then prior to that, I was at De Anza College for 20 years in multiple roles, you know, starting as a tenured faculty member in English, Asian American studies and women's studies and then moved into a faculty director role um, and was one of the founding uh, co-directors for our Institute uh, for Community and Civic Engagement, which is now called VITA, um, and then moved into um, you know, executive leadership uh, there uh, for six years before I left for Berkeley. And so, um, so I'm gonna kind of just focus right now in terms of VITA because I was there at De Anza College for 20 years. And um, I thought that prior to me leaving, it was very fitting that the Institute, the ICCE was renamed VITA after uh, Senator John Vasconcelos, who uh, really promoted uh, civic engagement, you know, shared power, democratic engagement amongst all of our constituencies uh, and he also was a mentor to um, my former president, Dr. Brian Murphy, who really um, was one of my mentors along with Elaine, <laughs> you know, and other uh, Campus Compact colleagues um, in this work as sort of a younger emerging leader uh, in the field of civic engagement. And so Vida, you know, is life, right? And so when I reflect on my journey um, in leadership to uh, create civic pathways in whatever institution I am in, you know, I reflect and I think of my family and how service, the valuing of community 
is very deeply rooted um, in my family and in my upbringing. But of course, it wasn't until my college years that I really started developing a consciousness around political engagement and social justice. So when I was a young girl, you know, my mother always told me stories about my grandfather, my Lolo Crosby, who really was a community leader um, in his town, his small town uh, in uh, Mindoro, the Philippines. And um, she had all of these wonderful stories about him and memories of how whenever something was happening in the village, that people would uh, come to the house and they would seek his um, you know, support and wisdom, whether it, it was like physically helping them um, or if it was just providing advice and bringing community members together. And so, um, and I did have the opportunity to spend time with him uh, before he passed away because he was very sick. He died when he was 55 but he was very sick and he came to live with us, um, you know, when I was uh, before middle school. And um, so with, with that coming from my family, I realized how my mother and her siblings were also very engaged in serving the community, whether it was through the professions that they chose to do, you know, or the community activities that they uh, decided that they were going to continue the legacy of my grandfather in the Philippines. And so, um, so that value is instilled in myself, you know, with my generation and with my siblings. Um, and then the other aspect of my family is that we immigrated to the United States shortly before President Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law. And so um, when he declared martial law, of course, all democratic processes and practices um, were subverted and undermined uh, in the Philippines. And then we, that era is known for um, so many human rights violations, extrajudicial killings. And there were a lot of activists that were political prisoners for a number of years. And so that is also part of my history and my consciousness. And so I, I always talk to my students about never taking, you know, my uh, rights as a US citizen, uh, because I did become a US citizen when I turned 18. I never take that for granted and I never take our democracy you know, despite some of the criticisms and all of the work that we still have to do to realize the promise of America, American democracy, because of um, that very real history that's even happening, say, similar things are happening today, you know, with the current administration in the Philippines, extrajudicial killings, martial law, you know, a subversion of democratic practices. So I wanted to share that about my family background and my history. And then I think the third thing that I wanted to share too around my own journey and my identity development is that um, when I transferred from Cypress College, Community College to UC Irvine, um, I then met very active and politically engaged professors, you know, in a number of my courses. And UC Irvine at that time was very early in the development of their ethnic studies department. And when I was there, they did not even have an Asian American studies. But several of my professors were already infusing their curriculum with ethnic studies content. And during that time, I became very angry that the histories of my community, you know, um, you know, because I grew up in Cerritos, so it was a very diverse community, that those histories and those stories, you know, were absent in the curriculum. And so I really consider the work that I do. And as I made the decision 
uh, to, to go into the teaching profession, I wanted to make sure that what, wherever I landed in terms of my teaching, that I would be doing multicultural education work and I would be infusing my classes um, to make visible all of those absent narratives that have really shaped um, the country in which we reside. So, um, so that's sort of um, kind of my background, my sort of political awakening. And then of course, when I um, you know, got tenured at De Anza College, um, I was given many, many opportunities by my colleagues uh, to really engage in campus organizing work, you know, and uh, working very directly with students, you know, advising associated student government leaders, advising uh, a number of clubs, and then also in terms of uh, participation in staff and uh, with other employee groups, you know, uh, working on uh, political advocacy issues uh, with other employees around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so, um, so then um, uh, Brian Murphy became our college president. And then um, he brought with him, you know, his background and his experience you know, in implementing civic pathways from San Francisco State University. And um, he uh, rightly so, which is one of my tips as well. You know, he kind of did an inventory and brought folks together, especially the faculty. And he um, sort of mined where there could be movement and synergy in relation to mobilizing the faculty who were already active in their individual classes and departments uh, in either doing critical service learning or social, uh, social um, uh, justice projects, you know, community action research. So he brought us all together and he said, hey, I really wanna start this initiative on campus, you know, um, talk to me and tell me how we can get this going. And so what we did was we formed a task force and we brought together about 60 members of the community, including faculty, classified managers and student leaders. And we spent a year, he allocated resources and we spent a year doing research uh, and looking at other programs across the nation uh, bringing workshops to campus so that we would become more knowledgeable, you know, in um, developing an action plan and then implementing this work. Uh, Brian was on the board for uh, Campus Compact California. And so he connected us to California Campus Compact with Elaine. Um, and so from, the, from that year of work, we uh, developed a plan a civic engagement plan and a budget, you know, aspirational budget of what we would need to uh, create an institute and begin the programming. And that was under the leadership of Dr. Cynthia Kaufman and Dr. Jackie Reza. And Cynthia now, you know, ha um, is the current director for our institute and continues to build it as a very strong institute. Um, so um, if, you're, if you've heard about what the work at De Anza, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but uh, we did, uh, we were ambitious and we developed a robust programming. So we developed critical service learning or community-based service learning. We developed a public policy um, school and uh, with our political science department and brought a cohort it would bring a cohort of students to DC. Um, we uh, supported um, and worked in tangent with two other leadership institutes on campus, APALI, uh, Asian Pacific American Leadership Institute, who was building a pipeline uh, for elected officials uh, in Santa Clara County, and then LEAD, which was a Latino empowerment at De Anza trying to really mobilize and give our Latinx students the tools to become advocates on campus 
and then also advocates in their local communities. Uh, we um, started working with our UNDOCU students and developed a project called HEFAS, you know, which was higher education mobilizing undocumented students to advocate for AB 540 students and dreamers. And then another thing that we uh, did was um, we um, also worked with our campus student activist leaders with the various clubs so that we could mobilize students to advocate for education. You know, when we were experiencing all of those budget cuts, you know, back in 2008 and 2009, and our students at De Anza really mobilized the system, you know, to start the March on March in Sacramento. So you could tell I'm just very excited about all of that work that we did at the college. And, um, you know, another tip that I want to provide is it's not only really getting the leadership at the top to really support these efforts, but it's also engaging everybody all all constituencies in the institution and really bringing everybody together and letting them have voice to co-create and build it together you know versus uh doing things sort of in a top-down manner and so i think when our stakeholders are engaged you know it really lends itself to sustainability when you put projects in place and you set up something like an institute. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and share a little bit now about um, my excitement, you know, when I became the president um, at BCC in Berkeley, because, you know, Berkeley certainly is a hub, you know, for uh, community and civic engagement with their long history. And um, my college was uh, next to everybody. <laughs> it was right next to City Hall in the mayor's office. So it was really exciting to um, uh, uh, develop more intentional civic engagement pathways um, at BCC because it had gone a little bit dark prior to me arriving as the president. And so I did you know, that inventory, who in the faculty was very active doing social justice projects I was very pleased to know that one of the themes that the entire college had selected for that year was a project called Rethink Justice. And it was an interdisciplinary project that already had five or six different disciplines engaged. And so as the new president, I said, this is fantastic. I'm all in, you know, tell me what you want me to do in terms of supporting. And can I, in, can I engage with everybody in terms of the dialogue um, and the conversations and the programming that we're gonna be doing, uh, you know, looking towards the 2016 election. Um, so that was very exciting. And again, I'm gonna kind of hone in that we had faculty champions already and we had active student leaders that worked with the faculty. And so for me, it was just about, again, providing the venue and the space to bring everybody together, you know, to do an inventory, what has been done, what were the reasons for why it kind of went dark, and we weren't actively doing um, even service learning projects anymore. And then here are the resources that I can connect you to in the networks that I move in you know, with Campus Compact, Fair Elections Network, <laughs> Campus Vote, you know, um, uh, the All in Democracy Challenge. And so uh, Rock the Vote, <laughs> East Bay, um, our elected officials. So it was very, I guess it was very um, easy in a sense, like the buy-in was very easy to really engage everybody in that work. And so by the time I left, what before I left and moved to City College in San Jose, um, we had moved from the bronze seal designation, you know, for the all in democracy challenge to the gold seal. And uh, we had increased student engagement almost by double, 
you know, according to the survey that came out in 2018. And the other thing that I'll highlight, highlight too is that we were able to continue to engage our undocumented students. Um, and as you know, statewide in California, uh, every October, we have a designated week of undocumented uh, student week of action. And so um, I then also lent in all in my support to the work that our undocumented community uh, resource center was doing. Um, and we uh, also became a Define American chapter. So our students um, in our undocu students were also provided uh, tools and funding to do grassroots organizing training uh, with Define America so they could do advocacy skills in addition to our student leaders participating in the De Anza project, you know, Campus Camp, uh, which was both uh, a combination of the Wellstone model, um, teaching students how to engage in um, formal electoral politics and advocacy and policy, but also bringing in the grassroots. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop there because you can get a sense of what now I'm bringing to my new institution. Um, and I've connected, I'm working with my director for student activities and campus life. Uh, he is now involved in a campus compact cohort, again, for emerging leaders who really want to do this work uh, at their institution. And I'm gonna hand it over to Elaine now. So thank you so much for the time. Wow, thank you so much, Rowena. Um, for sharing all, all your history of uh, the work you've been doing and your own personal journey as well. Um, I find the De Anza story especially, and even as you talked about BCC, um, such a great example of community organizing in higher education. Um, so thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna just share a little bit about um, why, civic and community engagement is important to me and, um, and who California Campus Compact and Campus Compact as a national organization is. Um, I believe that, um, well, for me, college was, my time in college was extremely transformational and I believe it can be so for many students. And I believe in experiential learning. Um, as a, um, Kim shared, I um, got a bachelor's degree in health science and a master's in public health at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, and I was on a path after I got the bachelor's degree in health science, I thought I was going to become a high school uh, health teacher. And um, so I was on that path and I had to do a little bit of student teaching. And I thought, well, of course, everybody's going to relate to health. You know, it's our bodies and and I remember sort of feeling frustrated that students would be like, is this gonna be on the test? And I thought, don't you care about this? And, and it sort of underscored for me the importance of how, how much we need to intentionally connect what their students are learning to what's going on to being relevant in their daily lives. And it also helped me to realize that I did not want to be a teacher and be, in front of a classroom day in, day out. And I pivoted and, and got my master's in public health and was doing community health um, instead. So, um, but I am surrounded by, my entire family is in education. So I've still been surrounded by K-12 teachers. Um, I ended up uh, working at UCLA in the school, uh, in the health department, in the, yeah, in the health um, department for a while doing health education. And it was um, after a few years of doing that that I decided I wanted to stay in higher education. And I started graduate school at UCLA in the Graduate School of Education. And that was when I first learned about service learning. I got involved in a pretty much the largest national survey um, study of service learning and did my dissertation on service learning. Um, so became um, deep, deeply involved in reading everything there was written at the time. This is, um, what was this, like 96 to, to 99. 
uh, everything that had been written about service learning. Um, and, uh, and then following getting my degree, I ran the higher education um, segment of the National Service Learning Clearinghouse. Um, back then, we had uh, money from the federal government supporting service learning through Learn and Serve. And um, so there was a National Service Learning Clearinghouse um, that still exists today, but is not as robust as it was um, around um, 1999-2000. Uh, I then uh, became the I returned to Northern California, which is where I grew up. I grew up here in the uh, Bay Area in San Jose and Willow Glen, for those of you who know San Jose. Um, and so I came back to Northern California and uh, became the director of California Campus Compact. Uh, so I'll take a moment now to just um, tell you, for those of you who may not be familiar uh, with uh, Campus Compact, uh, in um, 1985, several college presidents were lamenting about what they perceived as um, the lack of engagement uh, of college students uh, in not only voting, but other uh, being, well, it was more that that was the, what we were, I was in college at that time, we were called the me generation. You know, we were the ones who were concerned about uh, getting a degree so we could get a good job and make a lot of money. It was also when like, who wants to be a millionaire was coming on TV and some of these shows, it was just seemed the college presidents were very concerned about the college generation being very materialistic and less concerned and connected to their community. Uh, and they decided that they should form, they should use the, the bully pulpit of being a college president at that time to promote community service on college campuses. That there was research coming out, partly out of UCLA, that was talking about all the benefits that uh, a student outcomes related to participating in community service. Um, and so they created an organization called Campus Compact as a compact of college presidents who believe in community engagement. Uh, and it, after, it quickly grew to more than 100 presidents, more than they thought. And, um, and then they created a sort of state uh, compact system of, um, because they recognized that higher education is funded differently, is, is led differently, um, is, is organized differently in every state in our nation. And, um, so California Campus Compact was one of the first compacts that was started in 1988, and it is a presidential college president's membership organization. And when campuses join Campus Compact, then they receive all the support and services and resources that we can offer them. Whether back when we had Learn and Serve funding, we often gave mini grants and, and other grant funding out to our campuses to support the community engagement work on the campuses. We do things like um, programming and professional development types of activities. We put on conferences, workshops. Now in our COVID era and also just more recently, we've done more webinars, um, virtual gatherings, but um, definitely focusing on how to, well, really Campus Compact is about, um, it's an organization that supports the idea of the importance of community engagement, higher education for the public good. And so whatever ways that we can support your campus, um, uh, we offer awards and recognition. When we were first getting started, there was often only one person on campus who might have been championing this idea of service learning or of community engagement or civic engagement. And so part of what I think Campus Compact did in the early days, two things, was, was help create a field of people, people to connect with and to support you as the person on your campus trying to get this work going. The second thing that Campus Compact did very strategically was to focus in the, in the 1990s and early 2000s on bringing um, faculty, uh, trying to build a critical mass of faculty who were teaching service learning courses to bring it into the academic side of the institution and not just focus on all the benefits of community service, but the academic side 
was sort of saying, well, that's all the feel good stuff, but you know, how does it relate to, to the academic side? And so Campus Compact did a lot of faculty development trainings, workshops, et cetera, in the 1990s and, into, and, and to this day still does a lot of professional development and support for faculty. Um, here in California, um, we have a very small staff, but we, um, and we have currently around 40 to 50 colleges uh, in our membership. And it's across all types of colleges, public, private, two-year, four-year. Uh, and I would say um, in the last decade, we've had a little bit more of a focus on critical service learning and social and racial justice, as well as leadership development. And I personally, and you, this might not be a surprise since the way I started out this our session today, I like to make sure I'm supporting our folks on our campuses around resiliency um, and strategically addressing and being strategic uh, on how you engage with others on your campus and how you bring your administration along if they are not like, like a Rowena who's leading from the top and we're on some campus, really, the movement comes from the students and the community and the faculty. Um, so lately in the past decade, you know, Campus Compact has developed things like civic action planning um, to help campuses have tools to develop strategically and to embed some of that community organizing and campus organizing. Uh, by utilizing some different tools. We support campuses that are going for the Carnegie uh, engagement classification. Um, I think for me personally, uh, my interest in deepening my own understanding, my own personal learning around issues around racial justice, um, it stems partly from growing up as a third generation Japanese American um, whose parents were both interned. Uh, during World War II. And um, in fact, my maternal grandfather had connections to relatives in high government in Japan. And so he was actually sent to a camp, we call it a camp, but I would actually call it something else. Um, because he had connections, he was separated from my grandmother and her three children, which included my mother, and was sent for a year to a higher security camp in, um, in um, I'm blanking right now on the name, but I, in Texas, but it was much more like a prison camp. And um, a year later was reunited with um, my family, with, with my grandmother and, and her three, the three children. And my mom always talks about how he came back, not at all the same man that she knew when she left, when, when he left. So this experience of camp, of, of, of internment, um, deeply impacted uh, my parents, my grandparents, obviously. And there was still a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment even after the war. So my parents sort of grew up with this idea of assimilate, assimilate, assimilate. Like, don't, don't call out your being Japanese American. So they don't speak the language. They could understand my grandparents, but they were encouraged to always speak English. Um, and they were encouraged to just blend into the dominant culture in the United States. And therefore, I never really grew up, unlike other friends of mine that I know that grew up with strong social justice and, and activity and so forth. I was getting a very different message when I was growing up. So I sort of feel like being involved with Campus Compact over this um, 20 years now that I've been in the organization um, really was my learning ground for getting um, much more aware and reading and having conversations and discussions with much more, uh, I have a lot of mentors in this field who I've learned a lot from, including Rowena. Um, and just really coming to understand what true community partnership means, what it means to have a reciprocal relationship rather than the institution which has historically gone into communities and said, we're the experts and we know what to do. 
Um, and so I felt like I had a lot of growth over the years and, and then translated that into how I chose to lead California Campus Compact by offering programming, retreats, educational, professional development, leadership opportunities, particularly for people of color in the field to try and retain people of color in higher education. Um, so for me, the work of Campus Compact and the work of our community engagement, you know, there are a number of organizations out there that support this work and Campus Compact is just one of them. But for me, I believe our work is about transforming higher education so that more students can experience community engagement and um, that we can transform higher education to truly be for the public good. Um, and, and um, you know, Rowena has mentioned a few things we've done over the years, but really, um, you know, we want you to know you're part of a larger community. And while you may feel you're the only one on your campus advocating or you're the only faculty member in your department trying to teach in this way, um, you know, we hear you are actually part of a larger community and Campus Compact can help you connect to that and offer you quite a few different ways to get support, perhaps from outside your organization or your institution, but you can be connected to other people to support your journey of supporting civic pathways for your students on your campus. So I'm gonna actually stop because I wanna make sure we have time to answer for Rowena and I to answer any questions that you might have uh, for us. And I'll turn it over to Patty or Kimberly or Rebecca if you have questions that folks have for us. So we have time uh, here that we'd love to have you go ahead and put your questions in the chat uh, as we have done uh, with all our previous dialogues. And then that way, Kimberly and I are gonna be looking at the chat um, and that way we can ask the questions directly of our, our speakers. So please take a moment to ask your questions or type in your questions. Patty, Karen Wong had a question kind of back a little bit in, and I can, if I can find it, I'll read it. Um, let's see, here it is. Um, I'm curious as to how much these efforts were integrated into classroom curriculum and activities. And this is for, uh, directed at Ro Rowena's talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Karen, for that uh, question. Um, actually, what we tried to do is really deeply embed um, the work uh, and what and what we did was we not only um, got it in the mission statement uh, when we did the mission revision uh, for uh, De Anza College, uh, but we also, um, Cynthia Kaufman was able to get it um, into uh, as one of our major institutional uh, core competencies. And so uh, if you think about that um, in relation to curriculum development, and I know, I think Mallory is still here on the Zoom too, so she could maybe chime in as well if she'd like, but um, it actually facilitates, um, you know, uh, engagement of the faculty uh, to be including projects, even if they are outside some of the formal projects um, you know, that you might have under critical service learning, community service learning, or if there is an institute on your campus. Um, and then another example that I could give you just in relation to the projects of the existing work is that um, LEAD, for example, our Latino, um, uh, our leadership, um, Latino empowerment at De Anza program under the, um, direction of Dr. Mark Coronado. She's the one that started that program. Um, LEAD always has a proposal for action research project uh, that the students do. And so uh, they uh, make a decision around what they see as a gap on campus and they do research, uh, they interview folks on campus, uh, they put it all together, they make recommendations and then there's a formal presentation um, uh, to senior staff 
about what senior staff is gonna do to implement some of the recommendations. So that's another example. And then again, I think I mentioned earlier uh, the work that our uh, very engaged political science faculty are doing. And so uh, they um, also have a developed curriculum that's tailored around um, you know, local uh, campaigns. Uh, in addition to uh, what are some issues that the students can then take uh, when they do their visits uh, to legislators, uh, whether in Sacramento or DC. So I think really um, having a lot of examples uh, to provide to the faculty from uh, many disciplines uh, will be useful uh, in terms of um, moving, uh, get, gaining momentum uh, for institutional buy-in and transformation. Thank you very much. I, I think that's just a, an excellent um, way of putting it. And I, I, can, I can honestly say um, the work that has happened at De Anza and particularly um, the work that I know Mallory's been involved in and that Cynthia has been involved in for many, many years, um, just outstanding um, work on their part. We have a question. I'm actually going to try and condense it a little bit. It's a very lengthy question, um, but we have one of our uh, attendees is asking, um, how can we avert dangerous sectarian conflict and dystopia? Um, and I'm looking at the second part of the question. Uh, in other words, many of our students are showing signs of psychological burnout. So I reason inductively that this also is a natural, uh, a national and global um, kind of issue. And so I've kind of condensed it down. Um, it's a much longer question, but I think again, what I'm guessing is, is really, how do we take a look at the bigger political, social, cultural kinds of issues that are affecting students today? And that many of our students, I think, are, are just really showing that kind of burnout um, because there is so much national and global tension and conflict. I'll let uh, Rowena might have um, some better examples of, of actual programmatic or uh, stuff happening on campus for students. But I know I've been having, we uh, with Campus Compact held a call recently um, just in terms of preparing for post-election and trying to make sure campuses are thinking carefully about how to support not only students, but also faculty and other staff um, post-election regardless of what happens and making sure and and I'm we're housed at uh, Cal State East Bay and I actually just this morning I got an email going out campus-wide from the Student Health and Wellness Center you know talking about what services they're offering to support students I mean I think even before this election got um, to us as it we're now in the middle of actual election happening right now um, and there's lots of anxiety around that. The pandemic also has just created such incredible disruption, um, cha challenges, social psychological challenges for, again, not only our students, also our faculty and staff as everyone's juggling so much, but, but especially um, I think the isolation has really been challenging. And I, so, you know, we, we've been talking for the last eight months with California Campus Compact and, and our conversations with our directors around trying to figure out different ways to keep trying to connect students to one another and connect students to faculty. Uh, and and um, but, but I'm thinking perhaps Rowena might have examples of other um, services and support that, that is being offered to folks. So Elaine, I think that you brought up some, um, some great examples, especially um, for uh, post-election activities. And I see that my um, colleague, uh, Professor Clark is here from my sister college, EVC. And so she's been uh, putting out a lot of opportunities uh, for students to engage with each other and then also reflect. So at City College, that's what we have in place. Uh, we have, uh, we've made a couple of announcements this week for post-election 
uh, what we're calling as healing, you know, uh, healing circle, you know, conversations and reflection. And um, I think also the question was also motivated by all of the racial justice movements, the racial equity movements happening right now, uh, especially with um, since the murder of George Floyd. So I can just and keep encouraging that you all provide opportunities for even if it's just 30 minutes, 45 minutes, if you can provide those virtual spaces for students to just enter, you know, when they're available and maybe also offer them, you know, uh, one in the, in the afternoon and one in the evening for our evening students. Like I have many evening students, especially older adult learners. And I wanna make sure that some of the wellness activities and then that time for reflection uh, is afforded to them as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I know that uh, with AAC and you, you know, they funded these projects across the country for racial healing and trauma centers, you know, and uh, the toolkits for that and professional learning um, that I believe are also available on um, website on the website. And the, the Students Learn, Students Vote, SLSB Coalition. If you look up slsbcoalition.org, they also have a post-election guidebook um, where they've been collecting resources and have links to a lot of the nonprofit organizations out there that have facilitation guides uh, to have dialogues. Um, and obviously, there's also the deliberative dialogues. There's the um, Kettering Foundation also that has their... Um, I'm drawing a blank on the name of it, but they also have um, uh, facilitating dialogues, et cetera. So there are resources out there um, to support as well. But I, yeah, I think the healing, uh, the healing circles um, and, and like Rowena says, creating the space. And I know some of us feel like, oh, I don't have those facilitation skills. Um, there are lots of support for that as well. And there are other people who are trained that you could call in to invite in. Um, and I'm looking here, um, we actually have um, a really good statement and then a question. Um, we have, a, uh, Wissam has said, I feel the, ed the education we provided our students does not equip them um, or has prepared them to face the complexity of the problems they face now. And then Randall asked, when working with lower economic uh, students or as socioeconomic status, um, the need to is great for immediate income, yet we know how transformative service learning is. How do you present civic learning to these students so they choose civic prob so they choose a civic problem based um, on learn or excuse me I'm sorry uh, so they choose civic problem based learning do any campuses offer direct units for civic service is civic learning a mandatory part of existing courses. Elaine, do you want me to take to take this one? Because I think, um, like in, in terms of just for the credit part, I think that um, many of us um, who have developed um, community-based learning programs that we do try to infuse that into the curriculum, so that there are units. Uh, that the students are able to achieve. So if we're infusing in the GE, you know, with GE courses uh, for transfer, uh, then, um, then they are a part of the student's progress, depending on, you know, if it is, um, uh, the goal is for academic transfer uh, to a four year. This is from just the community college. Um, I'm not sure if her um, Zoom has gotten frozen or if it's just me, but I'll, I, I, I'll also mention that a couple things. Um, 
we at California Campus Compact offer, um, you know, a $500 stipend oh, you award could... opportunity. Yes. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. So yeah, yeah. So you could still, it, you could still um, infuse the courses that exist in the lecture space. And then also, I think that uh, depending on what the um, program is, you know, to really kind of contextualize the learning and the application. And so how, like for me, for my students, I've got several programs that have a direct connection to uh, economic recovery, you know, in uh, the Silicon Valley. So really contextualizing what they're learning and what their application is to how that's going to impact uh, the community. So. Um, I wanted to mention too that there are, are uh, the state of California has a new civic action fellows through the governor's office. So there are ways to involve students in opportunities where they could get a stipend through AmeriCorps. We used to offer that kind of program. We now have a community engagement student fellows program where students can be involved with um, guided um, with an advisor or faculty advisor um, in doing community engaged work um, and uh, then receive a, you know, a monetary stipend for doing that um, as a way to try and address that some people, while they really have a desire to get involved, they also need to pay for books, they need to pay for tuition, they need to pay, they need to help out uh, at home with, um, with bringing home um, wages. So, um, there are some of those types of programs. Um, I think, you know, there's been lots of conversations around trying to, especially I think it's, it's a challenge at the community college because so many of the student population is working one, two, sometimes even three jobs while trying to go to school. And it has always, I think, been a challenge um, for, for some faculty to figure out how do I incorporate a service learning component into my coursework, but not add to the burden of students. And so um, there have been some articles written about this and ideas around things that could be assigned differently to allow for that. Um, I think it, um, but it, it can be a, a very big challenge, especially if you have a large class. It's, it might be easier if you have smaller classes to really customize, but it, it, it definitely has been one of those things that over the years um, comes up repeatedly as a challenge. Um, and then not just at community colleges, but even at some of the four years as well. Um, we've seen such an increase of the number of students who need to work multiple jobs in order to afford higher education. So, um, Sorry, I'm, I'm sure that's an incomplete answer, but okay, go ahead, Rowena. Oh, I just wanted to quickly add that I was um, meeting with my um, Emoja, which is an African-American retention program coordinators yesterday afternoon. And we were talking exactly about this, that um, not the, the entire cohort, but um, probably about 10 students really want to engage in, you know, what they might be calling a community action plan. Um, and so they were, uh, we were talking about, well, what do we do? Do we try to provide a stipend for that, you know, or do you try to bring it into another programmatic element such as mentoring? And I said, it seems like you could just do a stipend for that. And that, um, that for students that complete their action project, then um, we can give them a stipend um, you know, via under our emergency grants, our student emergency grants, uh, so that we can also get around, you know, maybe some um, uh, uh, inallowables for use of public funds, you know, in terms of giving direct gifts to students. But we've been um, raising money for emergency grants. Uh, and there's a separate grant earmarked for some of our student uh, retention programs special programs and so they're going to uh, they're going to move in that direction so that's another idea i'll throw out that goes along with uh elaine's comments thank you and we have one last question before we move into our workshop and this is from kendrick kim and kendrick would like to ask the question directly 
Hi, um, I was just wondering, you know, when you were talking about um, the civic engagement of, you know, getting the students together and the healing process after the vote consequences, uh, I'm just I'm just curious in terms of long term, uh, how do you address the students that really do believe in the Charlie Kirk, Ben Shapiro, PragerU websites and really just kind of like correct them in a way that's um, not insulting and not offensive to those students? Because they, they I've encountered some students that really, really believe in those websites and I'm thinking, and I, I actually didn't even hear of them until they told me about it and they believe in a lot of the stuff that's going on with that website like um, gender is not a social construct it's based on only male and female um, a lot of misinformation that these young kids are are listening to on youtube so i'm, I'm just kind of curious how do we correct that in a way that uh, you know that doesn't cause conflict because we are in a heated uh, culture war between you know um, what, what's considered the left and what's considered the right and it's even to the point of science versus non-science you, you know what i mean so how do we kind of uh address the students that hey you know this information is cor incorrect and here's why without i guess invading their space to make them feel offended because uh i've noticed that people do get offended pretty easily when you do kind of point out with facts that that is in a completely wrong website to go to for your information especially on a lot of uh, issues like gender and LGBT is it's, it's incorrect. I, I just wanted to know your thoughts and anybody else that wants to kind of talk about that. Rowena, do you have any thoughts? This is a very complicated uh, mm -hmm. issue. I mean, I think, I mean, it, um, I understand the challenges. Um, you know, with uh, your question, Kendrick, but I think that um, we need to, you know, sort of continue to provide, you know, that um, literacy, you know, the critical thinking, you know, focusing on critical thinking and facts and bringing them into the classroom and especially also um, perhaps even highlighting uh, media literacy uh, in terms of fake news um, and the propagation of fake news. So I think those are things that regardless of whether we're in an election season that we have to keep doing any, you know, like that should be part of our curriculum and the conversations and those opportunities um, ongoing. Um, and then I think the other uh, strategy that perhaps, um, you know, we can use is to um, if it's outside of the classroom and, and people are participating in these virtual Zoom spaces that um, you set very clear ground rules, you know, in terms of um, the, the conversation um, and uh, facilitation work with the facilitators. So that's something that can be done. And then additionally, um, I think really providing opportunities for the diversity of our student body to give voice, you know, to their experiences, uh, because the more that they can really share uh, their experiences and where they're coming from, you know, their lived experiences, you know, it's my hope, you know, that that will uh, really, that will really generate empathy you know, and those, um, those connections can start to be made. So really hearing, you know, stories. Uh, Jose Antonio Vargas, you know, talks about it as, you know, he was asked this question, like, why are you traveling to all of these places and talking to people that, you know, could potentially harm you? And he said that he just really wants to listen and, and he calls it radical empathy you know, to really be able to listen to folks that really are not open, you know, to hearing you and seeing if you could, uh, you know, um, uh, break the glass, <laughs> you know, in terms of building connection. Thank you, Rowena. I, I, I really resonate with that last part of what you talked about. Um, and it's partly why I think Rowena and I chose to weave in 
our own stories because it it helps to uh, humanize the person and understand, have a little more empathy uh, of where they might be coming from instead of going right to a place of attack or trying to deny their experience. Um, and uh, it did, somebody put in the chat and I, I did want to second it. Um, I recently listened to, I think it was an NPR uh, podcast on media literacy uh, and it was really, really good and would probably provide some helpful um, context to this particular issue. So I want to turn it back over to Patty and Kimberly and Rebecca and um, because I know we wanted to allow you all time to be in discussion uh, through the breakout. Well, Thank you all did, very much. We just want to say we didn't mind going over because these, these were great questions and your responses were wonderful. Um, and certainly we really appreciate you taking the extra time to, to be with us um, and to answer these very, very important questions. And um, we've had several folks who've put in the chat, this is my favorite session. So, um, you know, that that's great. And we just want to say thank you again so much for participating in today's dialogue. Um, we've all learned a lot and you've given us some great ideas to carry on into the, the workshop here. So again, thank you so very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you both. I'll so put, we're gonna go, yeah, go ahead, Eileen. Oh, I was just gonna say, I'm gonna put my uh, email address in the, in the chat in case anybody does wanna reach out to me about joining Campus Compact and getting more information on that. So people can reach out to me directly. Oh, super. Yes, I'll do the same too. And if anybody wants more information also, um, College of the Canyons is a member of Campus Compact. So happy to also, um, you know, provide you with any, uh, with any information uh, that you, you might be interested in as well. And College of the Canyons is like another De Anza College with great experience and a lot of wonderful programming there under Patty's guidance and leadership over the many years, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, 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 it's, it's, I got the, the, how do I say it? De Anza was the model. It is the, the, the gold star. <laughs> so it is a fantastic program. But thank you again, yeah. everyone. We, we really appreciate you being here today. Yes, thank, thank you. you very much, Elaine and Rowena.